Sing Goddess, The Wrath of the Fawns, Smoke Pit Fairy Tales Part 2, Chapter 19, The Four Horsemen of Troy. De La Garza, Doc, the Fonz, and I prepared ourselves while the lieutenant was gone. We collected as many AK magazines as we could carry in our pockets and pouches. The Marines from Fox gave us ammo for our pistols. Fonzie had four belts of 240 ammo draped over his shoulders. Doc and I painted our faces green, then smeared our hands with black and pressed it into our faces, leaving a dark handprint over our eyes, mouth, and nose. Fonzie and De La Garza painted demonic sugar skulls over their faces. I thought you weren't Mexican. I poked fun at the Fonz. I'm not. But it looks cool, right? Fonzie looked like a villainous behemoth with Satan's eyes and an abhorrent volume of hate seeping through his veins. You're the personification of death, Fonz. Yeah, well, the skulls were De La Garza's idea. De La Garza gave a single nod and put a black bandana over his forehead. I am going to fucking drink Ivan's blood when we get there. We left our flak jackets and helmets with the platoon. The space we had to squeeze in the night was too small to bring them. Plus, if we got hit, we were dead anyway. For Fonzie and De La Garza, this was a suicide mission. For Doc and I, it would just be an immense pain if we were to fail. Eclair gave me an American flag bandana. Instead of red, white, and blue, it was black, green, and well, a darker green. Thanks, man. Good luck, brother. Eclair offered me a cigarette stolen from a Russian corpse. I handed Eclair my camera. This is one of your backups anyway, right? Eclair lit a cigarette. Yeah. Just be careful in there. Dude, you'll be charging through the gates not long after me. Uh, I'll see you inside. I wrapped the bandana around my forehead. I pulled two of the black feathers I had fixed around my tomahawk and put them in the knot in the back of my head facing down over my shoulder. Eclair turned back to us. Hey, let me get a picture of you guys before you go. The four of us leaned together and posed with our weapons. Our uniforms were shredded and covered with blood. We looked like beaten, broken monsters who had come back from the dead for revenge. And, you know, I, I guess that was literal for two of us. Eclair snapped the photo and checked to make sure it came out well. You guys could be the hounds of hell. Are you fucking devil-dogging me? Eclair smiled. Yeah. Fucker. Lieutenant Toshi returned with a rucksack over one of his shoulders. Good news, sir? Fonzie asked. Uh, the Colonel of Memnon wasn't happy about the plan. He wants to wait and organize a full-blown strike. Five paragraph order, everything. Well, sir, the division only has about a regiment's worth of Marines left. If this doesn't work, what's four more plots in Arlington on top of the thousands of others are going to have to dig? That's a fucked up way of looking at it, Sergeant Palacios, but you're not wrong. Toshi pulled a couple of ropes out of his rucksack, some aerial photographs of Ilium and four satchels. You know how to use C4, right? Yes, sir. Fonzie handed each of the four of us a bag. You got deck cord, detonators, and everything else you need in there. You can't disable the defense systems in there. I want you to blow the fucking gates down. Fonzie smiled. Then Fox Company's gonna shove a bayonet up Ivan's ass? You got it. Now, do you have any idea what you're gonna do when you get in there? Not a damn clue. But if we don't know what we're doing, Ivan can't beat us to the chase. But do us a favor, sir. What's up? If we start firing in there and start attacking the gate, maybe it'll throw Ivan off and he'll think we're a decoy. Sounds good, Sergeant. Toshi shook our hands. Semper Fi, Marines. We gave the lieutenant a new Ra and started for the night. Toshi told the plan to the Daedalus pilot. Our mech took the weapon from the night and pulled out its magazine. The Daedalus thumbed out the shells. They shook the earth when they fell. The mech ripped out the magazine spring. It lowered its arm and we climbed into the empty magazine well. We were inserted back into the knight's weapon. We waited for another marine to climb into the cockpit and set the autopilot. Hey, Doc, what if the computer in this thing has an auto kill function and shoots us out of the rifle like human cannonballs? Shut up, Hank. We were cramped. With the angle we were at, we were laying down instead of standing on each other's shoulders. The magazine stank of acrid smoke. There was a little air and light coming from the barrel, but it wasn't enough to relieve us. The engine hummed and gurgled. It sounded like a semi-truck was having sex with a tank. The knight's legs creaked and we started to move. The giant lumbered its way along. This thing's taking its time, huh? De La Garza commented. Apparently Ivan's not too concerned about recovering these things. At least it has something. It's a shitload better than being in an AAV. Oh, those things are fucking terrible. I'm fucking happy this thing doesn't swing its arms when it walks. The mech abruptly stopped. We shut up. We sat there, still for another hour, sweating and waiting for the Russians to just blow the thing up and leave us there to burn. The thought of burning, trapped in a metal coffin, revved my heart. I do, I do not, not want to be engulfed, engulfed in fire. fire. I don't remember, I don't remember the, the aftermath of the artillery, artillery shell and I ran. Probably, probably because, because I was, I was dead, dead, but... but if I stayed, I stayed conscious, conscious for that, that, I shook my head and snapped out of it. 
There was a booming creak outside, and the knight took a few more steps. The sound creaked again. Someone was yelling something in Russian below us. Voices moved closer. It sounds like they're the pilot out. Are we inside then? I think so. We waited. The mech moved again. This time, instead of creeping along, it moved with a sense of purpose. I stuck my head into the chamber and looked down the barrel. The concrete below us wasn't shattered. Oh yeah, we're in. I put a thumbs up over my head and either Doc or De La Garza tapped my foot in response. Thank God this thing fires from the open bolt. There was a lot of commotion outside when the night stopped. They were arguing about something. None of us spoke Russian and we had no idea what was going on. The argument turned to screaming, then the voices faded away with their footsteps. We waited until 2200 to venture out. Fonzie peered through the ejection port of our behemoth's weapon. The barrel was still aimed at the ground. Fonzie crawled out. Then me, Doc, then De La Garza. We used the cooling vents on the giant rifle as a ladder to the deck. The room was gigantic. There had to be a hundred brand new mechs just standing in formation on the other end. The concrete was painted black. The ceilings had to be a hundred yards high. Yellow lights illuminated a working space for the damaged mechs on our side. The pilot was missing from our night, but his blood had yet to be washed from the cold metal. Behind our night, a bishop lay on its back. A mechanic's upper body was crammed into a maintenance hatch. He was barking at the mechanisms inside the Iron Beast. His hand came out, felt for a wrench, then disappeared back into the machine. We crept up behind him, stepping lightly so we weren't heard. Doc pulled out his tomahawk. Fonzie and De La Garza grabbed the mechanic's feet and yanked him out. The Russian didn't get a chance to scream before Doc cracked his head open, spilling his brains onto the floor. We shoved them into the compartment and closed the hatch. We peered around for anyone else, but saw no one. I guess they're all asleep. Where are we? We must be underground. There's no space for this on the surface. Look at all these mechs. There's gotta be hundreds of them. Knights, bishops, rooks, and... We looked at a line of mechs we hadn't seen before. Whatever this is. They'll probably call that the king or queen. You mean czar. Why aren't they using these on us? They're probably out of pilots. I don't think you can just get in one of these and drive it like a pickup. Oh yeah, well, with half an ounce of luck, they'll never get to use these. Fonzie jerked his head to the side. Yeah, let's go. We bounded one by one through the mech's feet, being careful to stay in the shadows and not to make noise. We heard a couple of Russians talking idly around us, but they didn't seem to notice us as we passed. There was a hatch on the far side of the hangar. Fonzie leveled his 240 to the door and De La Garza opened it. No one was behind it. We went through. To our left was a staircase. Fonzie led the walk up with his machine gun slung on his back. The 240 weighed a little bit less than 30 pounds without ammunition. Most Marines had to carry it on their shoulders. Fonzie, being a descendant of the cockstrong warrior man gods, handled it with the ease of a pin. He had one hand open, ready to grab, and the other clutched tightly around his K-bar. We went into the first door and found ourselves at the top of a staircase. The lights were out over the room full of tables. Light came in from a large triangular bay window on the other end. We slipped in. The middle of the room floated like a pyramid. Out of each of the corners in its base was a tall, onion-domed tower. One of its sides had a large red star, and the other side had five red stars that formed the Southern Cross. Why is that on there? That's where the Virescents are from. I married one of them. Huh. How is that thing floating? No clue. I peered under it. There was an object reminiscent of a crystal ball, only darker, like translucent coal with stars in it. Maybe that has something to do with it. De La Garza looked at the evil-looking sphere under the pyramid. Quit gawking his shit. Try to find a map. We started looking over the counters and panels for some kind of direction. There were large computers on the walls. They had multicolored diamond buttons, levers, and wheels. On the walls were photos of Russians at parties with virescence. Some of them were posing, others shaking hands. Hey, Fonz, I found some documents in a drawer. Doc handed Fonzie the papers. Half of the words were Russian, the other half in the virescent written language. Think they might be important? Fonzie put the documents on a desk. They probably are, but that's not our job. I looked out the triangle window. Hey, check this out. I waved the Marines over. What is that? Looks like a space shuttle? I mean, I've never seen one that looks like that, but it's got the boosters, rockets, and everything. It's probably something I haven't built with the virescence. Too bad they're never gonna get to use it. Let's blow this popsicle stand. We have a gate to destroy. We continued through Ilium, trying to stay out of the light. Most of the halls were poorly lit and wide with stanchions. We moved in the shadows, barely even silhouettes, clutching our steely knives. Knaves in the night. 
Fonzie held up his fist and we froze in the darkness behind the columns. A lone soldier was walking through the hall. He had his rifle slung over his shoulders and stared at the ceiling as he walked. Before he passed us, Doc let out a sharp fart. The soldier stopped dead in his tracks and looked into the shadows where we hid. He pulled his rifle down to his hands and said something short. He was looking right at us, but couldn't see us. His eyes searched the darkness. He stepped in close, rifle at the ready. The soldier peeked behind the columns. I grabbed the barrel of his weapon. He pulled the trigger, but he hadn't taken the rifle off safe. He growled something in Russian and yanked back. I pulled him back to me and buried my tomahawk into the base of his neck. Doc helped me drag him to a corner where the least light shined. The soldier's final resting place was in the darkness of an evil citadel built with the power of otherworldly brains with socialist minds. Alongside one of the corridors was a map with a red arrow that we assumed read You Are Here written in Cyrillic. We took note of where we were and where we were supposed to go and kept moving about the complex. A ladder in a maintenance room took us to the night's fresh air through a manhole. It would soon be winter in Russia. The evening's crisp air let us know. I could just barely see my breath. We climbed out of the manhole to an area behind big metal storage boxes. Fonzie peeked around the corner, then looked back to us. We're at the airfield. All right, well, what's the plan? The front gate should be on the other side of it, but I can't see it through the lights. Fonzie pulled out the photos Lieutenant Toshi gave us of Ilium. He peeked back to the runway. Looks like the runway is right between us and the gate. I looked over the landing strip. Uh, we're gonna have to go around. There's like 50 guys over there. The runway was lit with bright blue lights. Soldiers were fueling and loading mechs. There was a knight on the tarmac. Soldiers with flashlights directed its path. A rook stood in a small hangar. Russians loaded it with ammunition. And mix. Fonzie glanced at the photos again and put them away. He pulled out his knife. Follow me. We crouched around the airfield, staying out of sight. We made it to the other side without incident. The sky was clear and the wind was soft. I could almost see every star in the sky. The moon was nowhere to be seen. The airstrip's control tower was built into the fortress's walls. A bubble stuck out a few stories up. There were soldiers inside using a substantial amount of communications equipment and dim red light. Below the glass sphere was a hatch guarded by two men. We hunkered down behind a truck and looked at the tower within the wall. It was only 100 meters from the gates. Fonzie scanned the entrance from under the truck. Think that goes all the way up? Yeah. Doc and De La Garza watched for centuries from behind. All right. You and Doc go around to the right, and I'll take Garza from this side. We'll take the guards out at the same time. We split and our pairs circled around the base of the tower. I looked at Fonzie from behind the guards and we exchanged a single nod. In sequence, Fonzie wrapped his arm around the guard's neck and ran his K-bar through his chest while I tackled the other guard and severed his spinal cord and his neck with my axe. The dead guard in Fonzie's arm dropped his AK. A burst of fire flew when it hit the deck. We all stood deathly still. My eyes touched themselves inside my skull. The soldiers on the tarmac scrambled for their weapons while screaming at each other. The bullets cracked past our heads and chipped away into the concrete wall behind us. Ilium's alarm blared through the citadel. God damn it! Fonzie pulled up his 240 and started spraying the runway from behind the crate. The other three of us joined in. The soldiers dove for cover. The door the sentries guarded burst open and a line of soldiers ran out. None of them made it more than a foot before De La Garza mowed them down. I grabbed Fonzie's arm. Fonz! What? We gotta get the fuck out of here! An explosion knocked us to the ground. My vision went blurry and my ears rang. I looked up over my body. Doc leaned up on his elbow. Anyone hurt? I patted myself down. I was fine. Fonzie and De La Garza knelt up. The side of the crate was splintered, but miraculously, we were all fine. More explosions blew holes in the ground and a line heading towards the runway. Motors! The Russians coming up from the airstrip dove down for cover. I grabbed Fonzie's arm. Let's go! Another explosion rocked the wall behind us. The red control tower bubble exploded. Glass and bits of metal rained down on us. I covered my head with my arms. A Russian soldier fell from the twisted burning hole in the wall, screaming. He was completely engulfed in flame. He hit the ground with a thud, but didn't die. He screamed and rolled on the ground. Doc aimed his rifle at the wailing soldier. Fonzie pushed it down. Let him fucking burn. We rushed over the pile of dead soldiers into the doorway. Fonzie took one of the ammo belts off of his shoulders and reloaded his 240. The mortar team kept upturning the earth outside. We found the stairs and sprinted up the stairwell. We came across the door to the control center. Smoke and fire flowed into the hallway. Soldiers were trying to wrest the flames with extinguishers. We killed them without hesitation. I peeked into the room. Red lights flickered over the distorted computers, radio equipment, and shouting soldiers trying to keep their fallen comrades in and out of the darkness. I pulled out a grenade and showed it to the other Marines. They nodded their heads. I pulled the pin and rolled it into the room. 
dust rattled off the walls and we continued our run up inside of the halls. We burst through a door and found a maze of pipes, ladders, and steel grated walkways lit in the color of blood. We hustled up a steel ladder on the wall to the top. We burst through the door at the end. Fonzie opened up with his 240. I was the last one out. We were outside. There was a group of six or eight Russians bleeding to death on the ground. We finished them off with single bullets to the head. Fonzie led us in a sprint to the top of the gates. There was a guard post on either side of it. We sprayed down the hut on our side as we approached. The other guard hut opened fire. We hit the deck and crawled to the structure on our side. De La Garza reached up and pulled the door open. Fonzie laid on his side with his pistol ready to gun down whoever was behind it. The soldiers inside were dead. Bullets still rattled the hut. We were pinned down behind the wall's concrete blocks. Doc and De La Garza laid facing behind us to cover the rear. The fire over our head paused. I reached inside the hut and pulled off the dead soldier's glove. I positioned it on the end of my rifle so that only the middle finger was raised. I raised it over the edge to show Ivan. A burst of bullets cracked over our heads and I pulled it down. Hey, do that again. I shot the hand back up into the air. When the Russians shot at the finger, Fonzie popped up and turned the other guard hut into a steamy mess. Fonzie and I crammed into the guard hut. Maybe we can open the gate from here and we don't have to blow it. Fonzie looked over the control panels. I looked into Ilium. No one was firing at us for the moment. The troops on the ground were scrambling to avoid the steel rain. The mortar fire from the Marines outside still hadn't stopped. I think Toshi's got the whole fucking battalion's mortar teams blasting this place. So fucking much for recovering intel. Fonzie clambered over the switches in the guardhouse, pressing every button and flipping every switch. I don't think this shit's gonna work, man. Fonzie turned his head. Garza! Get the rope and bring the C4. I took my satchel off and handed it to the Fonz. De La Garza wrapped one end of the rope around the concrete part of the parapet, then Fonzie wrapped all the C4 satchels over his shoulders and tied the other end of the rope to his belt. We plugged the detonators into the debt cord and put them down by the ledge. There's too much shit holding these doors up to blow them both down. I'm just gonna put the shit on this one's hinges. De La Garza and I held the rope and eased Fonz over the ledge. The Fonz had his feet on the edge of the gate. The satchels hung from his back. The debt cord reached from the bags to the guard hut. He looked at us in the eye and smiled. Geronimo. We lowered him down, almost to the bottom. Fonzi stuck the first block of C4 in place. We hoisted him up and he placed the second, then third, and fourth set of explosives. We were pulling up Fonzi and the Russians started firing at us again from the ground. Fonzi only had his pistol on him. Doc picked up the 240 and started spraying down the Russians. The Fonz fired at the Russians as we hoisted him up. We got him to the top of the wall. He holstered his pistol and grabbed inside the edge. De La Garza held onto the rope and I grabbed one of Fonzie's arms. As I was helping Fonzie, a bullet ripped into his heel, traveling through his body and blew out his opposite shoulder. Blood painted my face. The Fonz went limp and a river of crimson flowed from his wounds. Fonzie, no! I screamed, pulling him the rest of the way up. No! De La Garza cried. Doc, Doc, get the fuck over here! I laid the Fonz on the deck. Doc came running, crouching down to avoid fire. Oh shit, you gotta save him, Doc. De La Garza's eyes were already flowing a river of tears. Doc frantically looked at the Fonz's wounds. I, I can't, man. He was dead before the bullet left his body. I howled at the top of my lungs. The sky was clear and I could see every crater on the rising full moon's face. I grabbed the 240 and stuck it over the wall. Blow the goddamn gate! I pulled the trigger on the machine gun and screamed as a hundred little lead-filled demons were sent to possess the enemy. One of the other two set off the explosives, and with a thunderous clash, the gates of Ilium plummeted to the ground. It was midnight. The Daedalus get some rocked through the gate. It slid over the pavement, firing at the Russian mechs. It went to fight its own battle. The machine gun went dry. I grabbed the last two belts from Fonzie. Sorry bro, I need these. I slammed the rounds into the feed tray and held down the trigger. The barrel glowed red from the heat. Lieutenant Toshi was the first man through the Citadel's walls. Screaming through the gate, he led the charge. More and more Marines flooded into Ilium. The rounds passed through the barrel. I let go of the trigger. The barrel glowed bright orange and smoked. My breath was weak from screaming. We gotta line up with Fox. De La Garza said. What about Fonzie? We can't just leave him here. I know, but we can't carry him either. I stared at the Fonz. There was more blood than I thought a person could have pulled around him. Hank, we have to move. I put the 240 next to Fonzie and put my hand on his forehead. I stood up, grabbed my AK, and the three of us descended the wall. When we got to the ground where we had killed the guards, we bumped into a group of Marines who immediately pointed their rifles at us, startled by our appearance. Who the hell are you? Their staff sergeant demanded. Fox Company 27. You? Kilo 35. 
What the hell are you doing without your flacking Kevlars? We just blew the fucking gate. Which way, 7th Marines? The staff sergeant pointed towards the tower in the middle of Ilium. Awesome, thanks. Doc De La Garza and I bolted to the tower. Get some had been joined by a panzer in the brawl of mechs. The panzer was painted black and had tick marks for its kills painted on its shield. It had a picture of a jet with seven ticks, a tank with 12, eight for mechs, and a flying saucer with six. I don't know what the flying saucer meant, but I had too much shit going on in my head to give a fuck. The panzer did have something that looked like a bazooka that was turning the park mechs into craters in the runway. The mechs were pagan gods battling for control of the universe. Fighter jets screamed above us. U.S. forces had ordered specifically not to bomb Ilium because some fuck in Washington wanted the forces' secrets. Our fighters were keeping the Russian bombers, who would rather watch Ilium burn than see an American flag over it, at bay. We found Lieutenant Toshi barking orders to his platoon commanders and to the radio Korea had on his back. Fox Company was fighting their way to the central complex. Sir! Hey! Outstanding fucking job, Marines! Toshi shouted over the boiling cauldron of damnation we were burning in. Where's Palacios? He's dead, sir. Toshi paused for a second. Tom, I'm sorry. A roar shook the earth. A pillar of fire erupted into the heavens from the front of the complex. The space shuttle we had seen earlier in the night blasted towards the moon. Its silver hull shined in the darkness. Smoke settled around the inside of Ilium. It didn't hinder the violence below. What the fuck was that? I think it was a space shuttle. We saw it earlier down in the hangars. There's an entire other fucking level of shit under us. Great. That's just fucking great. What the hell else do they have down there? About 100 mechs. But they don't look like they were equipped for combat. Well, fight ain't over, gents. Get back to it. After the ship escaped to space, anti-aircraft batteries sent red snakes of fire to the sky to swat down our birds. A bishop kicked a Daedalus to the ground, crushing its head. Get some fired its cannon at the Russian mech, causing it to explode into a fiery hunk of twisted metal. The marked-up panzer fired at the Russian infantry. Fox Company was still hunkered down under the lead rain. Doc and I took cover behind a truck that had been flipped on its side. De La Garza took control of his squad. Glad to see you made it. Eclair startled me. I didn't realize he was there. You too, man. I gave him one hard pat on the shoulder. We were about 30 yards from the central building of Ilium. Ivan held most of its property. Get some grabbed the bishop's weapon and cleared the way for us, then blew a few large holes out of the walls. Toshi told us, Let's go! and sprinted towards the building. The company followed him. We poured into the structure. The Russians immediately inside were dazed from the mech's attack. We put bullets and bayonets in them as we passed over and headed deeper into the facility. We slipped on the shell casings and blood on the floor. The main power had gone out, leaving only an occasional spotlight to illuminate the way. The thick concrete walls muffled the war on the other side. I think most of them are outside. Eclair said as we crept through the dark, rifles at the ready. Yeah, there weren't too many of them when we came through earlier. I don't think the grunts get to come in here. This is creepy as shit. The smell of sulfur, gunpowder, and death haunted the corridors. There's a light! One of the marines in front of us pointed out, bright blue shine through the cracks in a large doorway. A squad broke away to investigate. It took four of us to pull the door open wide enough to fit the marines through. There were two unarmed Russians inside hurrying to burn documents and hard drives. When they saw us, they were overtaken with fear. They trembled for a moment and reached for more things to throw in the fire. Eclair and I shot them. How'd I know that they were going to destroy the important shit? Eclair tried to stomp out the fire. The room was filled with bizarre machinery. Hey, Doc, when, when did the alarm stop? I didn't notice it until you said something. I looked out at the triangular window on the other side of the room. There was a bay below us full of computer terminals and cylindrical water tanks full of the starry coal. Bubbles moved in the black orbs around the vats. The S2 is gonna have a field day with this shit. Eclair lit a cigarette. No shit. Hey, which one of you is the squad leader? I asked the Marines in the room. I am, Sergeant. You might want to radio Lieutenant Toshi about this. Aye, Sergeant. There was a circular platform on the side of the room, large enough for five or six people to stand in. Columns with enough lights to be a Christmas tree lined the circle. Attached to it were two coiled poles with silver balls on top. The triangular window that overlooked the computer room burst open and AK fire raked the room. We all dove for cover. It's just one guy! The shooter wasn't showing himself. He was raising the weapon with his hands over his head to fire into the room. Eclair and another Marine crawled over the platform with the columns. The rest of us shot over the windows to keep the soldier down. Bullets punched through the computer terminals in the other room. Sparks fell from the top of the vats with the starry coal and the spears dancing inside. A monstrous humming accompanied the electricity shooting through the air between the coils. The shooter raised his weapon again and let a burst into our room. 
Both of the rooms burst into flames. The squad leader shouted back, Fall back! One by one, the Marines bound out through the doorway. Doc and I covered them on their way out. Eclair and the other Marine were still firing from the platform, but the shooter had retreated. Claire! Hey, fuck that guy! Let him burn with the rest of this shit! Eclair was kneeling down. He grabbed the lever inside the platform to pull himself up. The lever fell, and lightning from the coils above engulfed the platform. The electricity cut the Marine beside Eclair in half, from head to foot. Eclair's body started to glow blue. His face was frozen. There was a pounding roar. Eclair and the lightning disappeared together into nothing. I was in too much shock to move. I stared at the platform where he was. Now, there was nothing but half of that other Marine. Doc grabbed the back of my shirt. Come the fuck on, Hank! I gaped at the machine. What the fuck was that? I don't think Doc could hear me over the fire, noise, and confusion. I shuddered walking backwards towards the door. Hank! What the... What the fuck was that? What the fuck was that? I don't know, dude. Where, where the fuck did a Claire go? Doc shook his head. Doc's mouth hung open. He ran a hand through his hair. I, uh, fuck. I don't fucking even. Doc shrugged, and we ran back out into the fights. Well, that was a fucking chapter sode. Episode? Chapter? Chapter sode. Thanks for tuning in. Man, there was a lot going on in that one, huh? You know, and what could happen next? We only have one more chapter of this book. That's fun, right? And then I'm already pretty balls deep into the third book. Uh, I think I just uploaded the seventh chapter to Patreon earlier this morning. That's my dog barking. Seventh chapter, yeah. So we're chugging along over there. Um, the third book will be starting to premiere over here on the tube in what, February, March, April? First week of April. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not taking, I guess, time off between now and then. I mean, I will be working on audiobook stuff over here on my end, you know, trying to get ahead a little bit, but over on, I don't want to say over on, that's the wrong word. In March, I should be doing some back and forth, having some live streams with the voice actors. So that'll be a thing. Stay, stay tuned for that. Be here for that. You know, if you want some behind the scenes -y type stuff, Maybe talk to a few people a little bit. And of course, if you don't want to wait for me to read these to you, you can't just go get the books. They're, they're on Amazon. They're not that expensive. I think they're like 15 bucks, most of them anyway. Or you could go get the war chest. Where, where is it? That, that, there, there, there's the war chest. And there's the war chest. No, I'm sorry. There's the war chest. That's the war chest mark too. That's the first six books. That's the second six books. If you get one, I put a pin on the map for you. I've been doing that mostly on TikTok and Instagram though. I should probably start doing that here. I'll record a few. I got some boxes I'm putting together today. So, you know, that'll be a thing. But yeah, exciting shit, right? All right. Well, thank you to everyone who's gotten a war chest and thank you to everyone who's following me over on Patreon. You're helping me keep being able to chug these out instead of, you know, having to go get like, you know, a, a real job and uh, you guys getting a chapter once a month because that's probably what that would end up doing. Um, you know, not, not exactly, you know, that I'm swimming in it or anything, but you know, I'm, I'm like right there. So... I want to thank all y'all for that. Also, I didn't mention there's a war crate. It's both of those in a bigger box. It, it's on the site. If you've, if you've seen it, you've seen it. Links down there somewhere or just smoke at fairytales.com. But yeah, anyway, um, back to what we're doing in March. Um, I'll have some voice actors on. So if you got anything you want to say to the, any of the voice actors that were in this book or, you know, questions you want to ask or comments or anything and you're afraid you might miss the live stream, go ahead and like leave those down in the uh, comment section and be like, hey, Chuck Lavaki, or to the guy who plays Doc, you know, here's question, comment, fucking whatever, and I'll, I'll save all that stuff and then we'll address that in a thing so you can watch that later if you don't catch it live. All right, well, I'm rambling. Uh, here, here, here are your bloopers. All right, um, I'll see you around. Let me know what you think. All right, bye. Chapter 19. Oh, it's gonna be a snotty day, huh? Have fun editing this shit, Trip. <coughs> God damn, dude. There's too much shit holding this. Mm, fucking a second to the last line. Fucking it up already. Here we go. I'm gonna just have to go take a fucking hot shower to get the shit out of my throat, man. Fuck. Snot E today. Eh, the Colonel Aminon. Amemnon. The Daedalus thumbed out the shells. The shells. The shells. The shells. Hey, let me get a picture of you. Yeah. Saying again. <clears throat> Before he passed us, that loud up. Just realized I was cutting out the word fucking from that line. That's that's unacceptable. Gotta gotta try that all again. Can't leave a fucking behind. <laughs> Farts. The red control tower bubbled.
blah, 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 blah. soldiers were trying to rest the flank. Rest? Rest? Oh, that's an interesting word choice. Okay, Trip. We hustled up a steer, steer ladder. One of the other two set off the explos- explosives. When we got to the ground where we had killed the guards, we bumped into a group of Marines who immediately pointed their rifles at rifles. They pointed their rifles. They pointed your rifles, Janish. 